comprehensive look, if you will, at Romans uh, chapter 12 and the whole idea of this study that we've been engaged in is, is to understand that when you really begin to appreciate who we are in Christ and what God has called us to be uh, as disciples of Christ, that as you walk through Romans chapter 12, you really begin uh, to see uh, a, a very detailed outline, if you will, uh, of how God expects his children to live, about how we are to conduct ourselves as true disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, if, if we just make it our life's aim and ambition to live out Romans 12, we'd be all right. God would be able to uh, do a significant work in and through our lives uh, to continue to build his kingdom and glorify his name, lifting up the name of Jesus. Amen. And so on this uh, concluding page uh, at the end of your book, um, our author talks about how as Christians, we are to be reminded that we are on a spiritual journey. Uh, Chip Ingram, he calls it a spiritual pilgrimage. And so uh, as we think about all that we've studied over uh, the, the time that we've been digging into Romans chapter 12, one of the things that we need to be reminded of most is that as children of God, as disciples of Christ, we're to understand and appreciate uh, that we're just pilgrims passing through here, that this earth is not our home. Amen. And that's why the Bible teaches us that we are not to store up for ourselves treasure here on earth. Isn't that what the Bible says? But that we are to store up for ourselves uh, and that eternal treasure where rust and moth cannot destroy. Isn't that right? Amen. That this world, brothers and sisters, if we are really striving to live for Christ, if we are really striving to live as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, etched at the forefront of our minds uh, has to be an understanding that this world is not our home, that Indeed and in fact, we are, as children of God, as disciples of Christ, we in fact are citizens of another country. Amen? We have to appreciate that. And that fact, that truth ought to dictate and galvanize our conduct, our character, our behavior. Amen. Uh, let's look at a passage of scripture that reminds us of that fact, that this is not our home. We are, in fact, citizens of another country. Let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. And uh, if you would, Brother uh, Johnson, Ray Johnson, if you'll read 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 through 12. Mm -hmm. First Peter chapter two, verses nine through twelve. Amen.
Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. That at one time we were aliens and strangers to the commonwealth of God. But when God chose us, he says you are a chosen generation. When God chose us and he revealed salvation in Christ to us, he says now that you are children of God, now that you have been chosen of God and a royal priesthood, a holy nation, we're to be strangers with respect to the world. You see that in that passage? He says there uh, in verse 11, dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims. You see that? No longer strangers and pilgrims to God, strangers and pilgrims with respect to this world. Because we are to be in the world, but not of the world. And so uh, the things that attract uh, and lure and please those who are of the world, those things are not to be the same attractions to the people of God. Uh, th th those things should be strange to us. Amen? As strangers and pilgrims. He he's helping us to understand and appreciate that this environment that we are called to move about in, this is no longer our home. We shouldn't feel comfortable here. Amen that uh, we are strangers and therefore as pilgrims and strangers we should abstain from some of the things that the world indulges in because we're not trying to please ourselves we're trying to please him who has called us out of darkness and placed us in his marvelous light yes brother Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Amen. Amen. Sure. Amen. It is uh, a, a difficult thing because the truth of the matter is uh, we, we, we have two natures within us. Uh, that's what Paul talks about in Romans uh, chapter 7. He says, when I would do good, that, that evil is, is all around me. Uh, and instead of doing the good that I know to do, I find myself doing the evil that I know not to do. It says, oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And then he says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ. And so uh, we have the power within us, brothers and sisters. We're called to live our lives differently than those individuals who are of the world. And so what, one of the first things we're called upon to appreciate again uh, as, as we strive to live out our lives as disciples of Christ, as we strive to walk in the spirit of what we've been studying over the course of uh, what seems to be a year now, we, we have to understand first and foremost that we are not our own. We have been bought with a price that this world is not where we belong that we should always walk around with the understanding that we are citizens of the kingdom of God. And as such, we are to represent our Lord and our Heavenly Father. 
Therefore, we are not to live nor to desire the things of this world. And that's what uh, John reminds us over in 1 John chapter 2. And I'll read that for us real quick. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 and 16 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man love the world, look at this, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, this is all you're going to get, is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And he says, is not the father, but of the world. Uh, and, and, and so, and then he talks about in verse 17 how the world is going to pass away in the lust thereof, but he that does the will of God will abide forever. And so uh, that, that's one of our first calls, our first duties as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are to separate ourselves from this world. We are to understand that this world is not our home. Now, also, we're reminded while we were on this journey that although we may never be perfect, uh, it is God's will, brothers and sisters, that we be continually transformed in head and heart to reflect the beauty, the love, and the holiness of Jesus Christ. Amen. That, that even though uh, we still struggle, none of us are all that we ought to be in Christ. All of us thank God every day uh, for covering a multitude of our sins. <laughs> Amen. Just like uh, Pastor Terry Anderson says uh, from time to time when he preaches here, if the skeletons fell out of any of our closets, all of us would have to hang our heads in shame. But, but even though we're not perfect, we're to understand that it's God's passionate desire to continually transform our heads, our hearts, to reflect the beauty, the love, and the holiness of Jesus Christ. That, 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 that's God's whole entire program for fallen humanity is to once again cause us to reflect his glory as seen through his son, Jesus Christ. That, that, that's what it's all about in a nutshell. If, if you read the Bible from Genesis to the book of Revelation, you will come away with this understanding that in the beginning, God said everything he made was good. If you read Genesis chapter 1, around verses 26, 27, 28, it says, Let us make man after our image and our likeness. Isn't that what it says? And so it talks about how God made male and female after his image and after his likeness. And if you read the very last verse of Genesis chapter 1, which is verse 31, it says that God looked back over everything that he made and he said it was good, including man. But what happened? Sin entered the equation, Genesis chapter 3. And so if you fast forward, to Psalms 51, David says, with respect to himself, but speaking for all mankind, uh, uh, Psalm 51, verse 5, I was born in sin and shaped in iniquity. Because what happened, brothers and sisters, is when sin entered the equation of our lives, the very image of God uh, that we were cast in back in Genesis chapter 1 is now distorted. It's now marred because of sin. 
And everything that God has been doing throughout biblical history in the life of man since the fall of Adam and Eve is to restore the reflection of his image in man, in woman. And so that's why he comes along and he speaks through the Apostle Paul and says in 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, if any man, if any woman be in Christ, the new creature, all things are passed away. Behold, all things are become brand new. And, and so it's in Christ that once again, we're able to reflect the glory of God as God sees Christ in us. And, and, and so from there, we, we begin to understand what has happened with respect to salvation, that God has restored us to right relationship with him through Jesus Christ, but he also empowers us through the spirit that resides in us to once again reflect his glory. And so now here's what we have to do. Now we're back to Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. I beseech ye, brethren, by the mercies of God, there ye are, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to the world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. That if, if, if God is going to complete his work in us, th there's some things that we have to do. Amen. That uh, in this work of sanctification, it's necessary, brothers and sisters, that we yield ourselves over to the Spirit's work. And he says two things that you need to do in order to make that effective in your life. First, you must alter your life. You must surrender your life completely over to the will and the authority of the Holy Spirit. By the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. And then daily, we are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And I love that word transformed in the Greek language because it's where we get our English word for metamorphosis. And the wonderful thing about a metamorphosis is I always equate it to, in science terms, you have what's called a, a, a mixture, and then you also what has what's called a, a chemical transformation. So with, with, with a mixture, a mixture is just like putting together a salad. So with, with a mixture, you can start with uh, some iceberg lettuce. You can throw in uh, some cut up tomatoes, some cucumbers. Uh, you might even want to throw in boiled eggs, bacon, however you want to make your salad. You can toss it all together and mix it up. But at the end of the day, if you wanted to, you can go back because some folk don't like tomatoes in their salad. Isn't that right? So, so they'll pick it out of the mixture. Some folk don't like cucumbers in their salad. So they'll pick the cucumbers out of the mixture. But, but what happens in a chemical reaction, what happens when we go through this metaphoric change, this transformation of mind, once it takes place, it never gets reversed. 
It should never change again. So that when that caterpillar comes out of its cocoon with wings, it can't go back to being a caterpillar anymore. Amen? The tadpole cannot go back from being a frog back to a tadpole. Amen? And, and so this is what God wants us to understand. When he says, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, he's saying a metamorphic change is to take place in your life so that you never again begin to think the way that you used to think when you were out there in the world. And that's why we sing that song. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. Uh, and, and so he, he, he says that even though we may never reach perfection, that we are to continue to strive towards transformation. And we do that, brothers and sisters, as we yield our lives to the power and the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. As we yield our lives to the cleansing power and the transformative power of the word of God. Amen. Uh, and, and, and then uh, he, he talks about in this concluding section how God has two purposes with respect to our lives. And, and that is for our lives to, to, to do good in our lives and for our lives to bring him glory. God seeks only to do good in our lives. And as God does good in our lives, God wants to then use our lives to bring him glory. And what he helps us to understand uh, is that if we strive to live in this Romans 12 relational lifestyle, we do so not to earn God's favor, but to tell God, thank you everything that he has done and as we strive to live in this relational lifestyle as we've studied throughout Romans chapter 12 then what happens is our lives are benefited but God's glory is expounded in us and through us that because what Romans 12 essentially provides us, brothers and sisters, is a blueprint through God's word on how we are to live as effective witnesses for Christ, who in turn glorify our Heavenly Father. And so we, we, we close out this, this lesson, this, this whole study, with this profile once again of a Romans 12 disciple, and he provides it for us on the bottom of that page, that first we are to surrender our lives to God. We are to separate ourselves from the world. We are to maintain a sober assessment of ourselves. We are to serve in love and then lastly, we are to supernaturally respond to evil with good. The, those are the pillars of what it means to live as an R12, a Romans 12 disciple. And, and what we're made to appreciate is that, again, if we can begin to, to live out this one chapter of Scripture, effectively following it as the spirit gives us the power to do so lord have mercy what would the lord be able to do with new rising star if we had a church full of people who decided if i don't live out any other body of scripture i'm gonna live out romans chapter 12 and let's see what the lord do with it lord have mercy you're talking about a church full of folk who have altered their lives to God. 
You're talking about a church full of folk who are striving to live with transformed minds, not minds conformed to the world. You're talking about uh, a, a church full of folk who are humble in their self-assessment of themselves, a church full of folk who are serving God in love, a church full of folk who are supernaturally responding to evil with love. What kind of church would this be if we just dared to try to walk in the truth of Romans chapter 12, uh, God would get so much glory, so much more honor uh, out of each of our lives. Uh, and, and so that's the challenge, brothers and sisters, uh, that, that we've been on throughout this entire study to, to look at ourselves individually and see where am I with respect to being the kind of disciple that Christ has called me to be, a disciple who is totally surrendered to God. Can you say that? We, we still have some work to do, don't we? In order for our entire lives uh, to be altered, A-L-T-A-R, unto the Lord to live a life separated from the world, to, to live a life in sober assessment of, of who I am. I am what I am by God's grace. And, and so I, I don't have any time in my day or in my life to look down at you because of how you live. I, it's going to take everything I need just to keep me right. Amen. To serve one another in sacrificial love. Lord have mercy. Not, 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 not to serve one another conveniently, but to serve one another in sacrificial love. And then... Lastly, once again, to supernaturally respond to evil with good. What would our relationships be like if every time someone mistreated us, through the power of the Spirit, we were able to supernaturally respond to evil with true Christian love? That would be a beautiful thing, wouldn't it? Now, let's tie this off real quick, and let's look at these uh, relationships that he lists down there uh, in that R12 profile. And then, believe it or not, we'll be done for the night. But when you look at that first bullet point where he talks about how the journey is ongoing, and he talks about uh, being surrendered to God, when we think about the relationship that's a relationship between self and who? He says, be surrendered to God. So that's a relationship dynamic between self and who? Self and God. Amen. Now, when he talks about being separated from the world, again, that speaks to self's relationship with who? With the world's system, the self-relationship, it, it, it again focuses on the relationship between self and God. And then when you look at the third component, sober self-assessment, again, that focuses on the relationship between self and God. So the first three pillars is about getting myself right with God. And then when we start talking about serving in love, now we've moved to the relationship between self and who? Others. Amen. Because the only way that you effectively serve God is you got to be willing to serve others. That's what Jesus taught over in Matthew chapter 25, if my memory serves me correct. He says that when the king returns, he's going to ask this question. When I was hungry, did you feed me? 
When I was sick, did you come and visit me? When I was in prison, did you come see about me? When I was thirsty, did you give me anything to drink? When I was naked, did you clothe me? Because in as much as you have done it unto the least of these, guess what? As you serve others, you serve God. And so that next relationship about serving in love has to do with the relationship between self and others. And then that last pillar, supernaturally responding to evil with good, what relationship does that speak towards? Self and who? Self and others. Amen. Self and others. And, and, and so we, we see as we look at this Romans 12 disciple relationship model that, that it speaks to both the vertical relationship, our relationship between ourselves and God, but then it also speaks to that horizontal relationship, our relationship with self and our fellow man. And if we strive to walk in Romans 12, uh, God will bless our lives and we will bless God. Amen? All right. Thank you for your time and your attention. I hope that uh, as we move through uh, this book that you really got some things out of it that uh, you can take it and digest it and begin to implement it in your own Christian walk. Was anybody besides me helped by going through this study? Amen. Well, praise God. Thank you so much. Some of you have been so uh, faithful and dutiful and coming as much as uh, you've been able to come and really want to thank you for your